so it copes this way, I'll put my hand up. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hiya. Hello, welcome to the, the, the later session. And I'm going to try and get you all up and active. And in, no, no, but try and raise the energy up here. Because you've just had an hour and a half of sitting down going, hmm. Followed by David Snowden with all of his massive data. I don't know about you guys, I feel like you put a big bubble around your head and you're just trying to move your head in to catch different parts of it. But uh, it's all good stuff. So I'm Dan Brown, or Kanban Dan, which I finally gave into due to a colleague pressuring me at uh, an Agile coach that I was working with. Um, I am an Agile coach. I'm a Kanban trainer. I'm, a, I'm in the LKU on the advisory board as well. And I'm going to talk to you today about lots of different things, but mainly I want to challenge some of your preconceptions. Preconceptions I have heard about Kanban or around Agile. Estimates will inform us when things will finish. Kanban uses really difficult maths. It's not for me, I don't like difficult maths. You can't limit WIP in big organizations. We have to do all of these things at the same time. And validated learning's great, but it's not really the primary output. It's, it's not gonna actually deliver anything. So I'm gonna try and challenge those, and in the next 40 minutes, you can tell me if I've done a good job or not. So, estimation. Who can tell me how many the st stars there are in this photograph? Many, yes. But the question really is, how good an estimate could you give me in 30 seconds? What about if I gave you five minutes to go and get an estimate? Would it be better in 30 minutes? How about if I give you two weeks to go and estimate how many stars are in this photograph right now? My guess is you'd probably know as much as you'd ever know after five minutes, after you work out, oh, that's Andromeda, and you went and hit Wikipedia and asked how many stars are there on it. And you'd probably never get better if you spent your life studying Andromeda Galaxy. You'd probably not get a much better estimate. How about this one? I'm raising the ante here in a bright room with a black photograph. But we have two galaxies, M81 and M82, Bode's Nebula, if anyone's a really geeky astronomer like I am. How about this one? This is the Hubble Deep Field photograph. Everything you can see on that photograph is a galaxy, apart from the things that have these little diffraction spikes. So there's about four or five stars on there. Your friends cannot help you now. The point is, how good an estimate did I get for this in less than 15 minutes? And how much better it would be if I spent my entire life studying it? So I'm gonna say we substitute predictability for estimation. It's my posit to you that when a businessman comes and asks you for a better estimate for your technical delivery, actually what they don't want is an estimate. They want predictability. They want to know, when will this thing finish that I'm working on? They want to know, by this date where we must go live, what will we have done? They want predictability. It's like if you're having an extension built on your house and you get a build around, do you want an estimate? I kind of want a quote, because if I ask for an estimate, I know it's going to cost twice as much as he's telling me. So warning, yes, we do have some maths on these slides, but I do have an example to try and make things easy. So I'm going to walk you through a metaphor. It is a simplified metaphor. Please bear with me. And I will be asking the audience questions, maths questions. Anybody here not been to a drive through Show of hands. Wow, that's cool. So this slide's for you. This is how a drive through works. You Go to a fast food restaurant of your choice. So you turn up at McDonald's, and you decide what you want to order. You tell them what you want to order. You pay for it. They give you some food and drink, and you drive off happy. That's the premise. Drive up, pay, order, get food. And I'm going to follow on from what Mike said this morning. And we use almost identical terms, which is great and be really clear. So I did the same research as Mike probably did when we were talking about things like lead time and cycle time and found out that manufacturing says this and supply chain says that and this other manufacturing over here says something completely different. So I've decided in, it's, it's now an absolute essential thing whenever you're talking about any of these measures that you define what measure you're talking about and make that clear. So lead time or cycle time, whichever you prefer, 
is the time it's going to take from a particular customer driving up to the first window and placing their order, starting to place their order, to when that particular customer drives away with the Dan Sandwich Special and Big McCoke thing. I'm going to refer to the throughput rate, almost identical, that I ended up, and it's accidental I ended up with uh, Mike's term as well, but how frequently people drive away with food, how often someone dri drives off happy. So back in the origins of the drive-through, they used to only have one window. Someone just thought it would be a really good idea to save the guys getting out of the car, we'll have a window, you place your food, you pay for it, and you get your order. So. Nice and simple measures, right? Lead time is the same as the cycle time, or the throughput rate, sorry, I should say, let's be clear on this, throughput rate. So it takes me 90 seconds between driving up and starting to place my order to driving away with some food. While I'm at the window, no one else can come. They're in the queue behind me. So when I drive off, 90 seconds later, someone else comes up. So every 90 seconds, somebody's driving away on average with their food, and it takes 90 seconds. Simple. Say yes, Dan. Yes. Hey, we've got a live audience. Fantastic. So some people did work out how you could improve that. They thought what we need is two windows. The two-window system, I'm going to call that, where you order and pay at the first window. Nice round number, 45 seconds. And you collect your food at the second window. Again, 45 seconds. So how is that going to affect our, our measurements? What's the lead time going to be? 90 seconds, it's still 45 plus 45. What's the throughput rate going to be? 45 seconds, absolutely. So, yeah, every 45 seconds, someone drives away happy, but it still takes me 90 seconds to get my burger. So I've really not changed anything for me. It's just more useful for the, for the company. This is where we get tricky. Pop quiz. What happens if you have three windows? So you might have noticed some drive throughs when they are busy, and it typically only happens at the busy times for meal times, have three windows open. One's usually an intercom system where you order, you pay, and you collect. I've, get, I've kept the numbers simple again. This is a nice, simple metaphor. It's not real numbers. I should stress that because I like real numbers, and these aren't. So what's going to happen? What's the lead time? 90 seconds. See, I told you this was easy. And throughput rate? 30 seconds. Absolutely. So, right, we've established that. That's how a drive through works. You now know more about drive throughs than you ever wanted to. And trust me, the next time your kids nag you, you will be going to a drive through and this will be in your brain and you will not be able to get rid of it. And think how clever the fast food companies are at the way they manage their things. Like, it really does my head in how clever they are, actually. But who cares? This is just drive throughs right? Well, your customers care. Throughput re rate is how often features come out of the line. So if you're a head of IT and you're looking at your teams, you want to know how often they're delivering stuff because that shows how good your department is. And that when you're off to the board meeting with the rest of the business, they're going to think of you well based on how much stuff you're getting out there, right? This matters to this head of IT, IT kind of people. Lead time. Well, when this feature is going to be done if we started it now? So your product owner, your customer, if you're going to go in XP, ter XP terms, they really care about that. When am I going to get the thing you've promised me? I, I loved, um, again, Mike's um, column that said committed. That's a great word. I hate the word commitment when applied in Scrum, but actually there, committed, because actually even if we just said we might start it, your customers kind of heard, yeah, we, you, you're committed to delivering this now, and by the way, I've already booked the TV airtime and stuff. That happened all the time to my career. But put the two together, and it's also going to allow us to predict when a whole product or an MMF or an MVP that was mentioned earlier, so minimal marketable feature or minimum viable product or whatever the big thing is, the big thing you're trying to get out there, it'll let you work that out. Again, using very simple maths. So when will my product be done, Dan? Well, let's pretend we, work, we deliver something every two days. I'm looking at Chris Young at the back because this should sound familiar in terms of stats because this is basically how things happened at UView when I was working there with him. So I've changed that one every two days to 0.5 per day. So if you're going to use the maths, 
Simple rule, the units have got a match. If you're comparing two things, you've got to use the same units. We're going to use units of days. So it's 0.5 is your throughput rate. And your lead time for delivering a work item is 11 days. Again, this is empirical data, rough empirical data, because I don't want to give you decimal places. There's no need for them. So let's pretend we have 100 work items to finish. All we have to do is put those two things together. So we're going to say 11 plus 100 divided by 0 0.5. 211 days is your product time. So what I'm basically defining there is saying, you kind of have to get this one through first. The minute my team's delivering nothing. So I've got to get my first card through the team. That's going to take me my lead time, right? That's going to take my burgers getting cooked. Then it's how often do we deliver? Every other day, every half day. So divide by the number of features by that, add the first one, 211 days. Actually, technically, it should be 11 plus 199 divided by 0 0.5, but let's not split hairs and keep the math simple. Take note of variance to averages. Though. So all of the things I'm talking about are averages. The reason you need to do that is, if you wander up to your stakeholder and say, it's going to take 211 days, they've gone and booked the newspapers and the telly slots again. What we really need to tell them, it's going to take 211 days plus or minus blah and blah. If it's statistical and real mathematics, there's a lot more of a useful conversation than if it's just made up, well, kind of like plus or minus four weeks or plus or minus whatever. So actually working out what these variances are, which Excel for all its charm will give you nice little things like standard deviations that let you work it out magically. I'm not going to go into the depth of it. It's not as hard as you might think. In fact, for free, I'm about to publish out an Excel um, spreadsheet that will work out a cumulative flow chart, control chart, and a spectral analysis chart, if you really want to go into that detail, based on just giving it some <coughs> simple dates of when something was ready, committed to, started, finished, and deployed. And it'll draw all that with predictable lines, with all those things built in. So I'll, I'll try and publish that and tweet about it later once it's live. So how can I use my maths to help me? Well, you probably heard Little's Law mentioned earlier. I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail today, but the one thing I will say is that bit there for stable systems is really, really important. So Little's Law is queuing theory, and it's designed to be applied at the front before a system starts. For it to be applied at the end, which is kind of where us Kanban guys like to apply it when the work's going to be finished, it assumes that you are actually shaping your demand so that one thing gets pulled in as one thing is delivered. So if you're bu pulling in more work and committing to more work than you're actually delivering, this ain't going to work. You must make your system stable. But in general, if you're just pulling in more work and you've got no room to take it, you've got bigger problems than the math's not working. <laughs> True. So if we don't have time for that. If you do want to talk about Little's Law, please do come and grab me later. I could probably whistle for hours about it. I'm just that kind of guy. Or, <coughs> uh, shameless here, um, I do happen to teach an accredited LKU Kanban course. And if you look me up or you ask for a card or a flyer, we might even give you a nice little cheeky discount for coming today on a Saturday. So I'm happy to talk about it there, and I've got some nice little ways to try and get it in there for you. So back to my drive through McDan's is all there. Let's pretend, so we've got back to our two window system because that's how most of them operate most of the time. But actually, I'm going to try and blow your minds a little bit now. Turns out that it takes more time for the burgers to get cooked and therefore be delivered to you than it does to pay. So actually, window two takes you 50 seconds. Window one only takes 40 seconds. What's the throughput rate now? Less confidence, but yeah, 50 seconds. It's going to be your slowest window. The fact that it was window two is neither here nor there. If you think about it and think about actually how you would be sat in your car at the drive through if window one took 50 seconds and window two took 40 seconds, it'd still be every 50 seconds someone drives away happy. You'd just have 10 seconds of slack at the second window with nobody sitting there. So the whip is two, and we just said the throughput is one every 50 seconds. Anyone going to take a stab at what the lead time is? Nine. 
90 seconds, that's what we did earlier, we added the two times together. No, nope. it's 100 seconds. So why is it not 90? Little's law tells us that, by the way, that's, that's the, 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 the Little's law in action. Anyone got any ideas why it's not 90 and why it is 100? Exactly. So if you've got two people wanting to get through the system, I should really have stickies on a wall moving them along here to show this. That works really well. Um, if you've got two cars trying to get through, the first one might have only taken 30, 40 seconds to pay, but he can't move forward. There's a car in front of him. The car's stuck there for another 10 seconds while he gets his food. So although that's only taken 40 seconds, there's, 40, there's 10 seconds of waste while he's stuck and till one's the window one's just blocked, can't get anybody in there, and it has slack on its hands. So it's actually two times this. And Little's Law shows us that. It's nice and simple, but understand the truth of your system and look out for the pitfalls, I guess is what I'm saying there. But that isn't true. Let's get in the real world. What really happens is all these fast food companies, and try not to brand drop, are clever. So they actually have you driving around the building, don't they? You order and pay at window one, then you drive around the corner. Oh, you can't drive around the corner. Why not? There's a car in your way. And there's usually a car in his way and a car in his way, and then there's a car at the window. Typically, you've got three cars between there. So guess what? What's happened there? We've got two people at windows and three queuing. What's that done to our whip, our work in progress? How many cars are in progress? Five. So we're still having to take as long between the wind, uh, at, actually at station, but we've changed our whip from being two to five. Well done. <laughs> Told us to get it right. So throughput rate is still one every 50 seconds. The lead time is the throughput rate multiplied by the whip. So what's the lead time? Come on, class, you can do this. <laughs> I feel like a teacher here. Okay, I'll save you the math. It's 250 seconds. Five times 50. So it's the same system. You're spending just as long at each window, but because there's a queue of three between our windows, just sitting there doing nothing, the lead time on any individual one has gone up, and it's gone up more than 100%. That's big. That, that need, that we need to then apply that back to our work if we're de actually developing software and we've got stuff sat idle, it's in our dev done but can't move into, into uh, QA yet because you've got a whip limit stopping you getting in there. And you've got all that extra work doing nothing, affecting your lead time. Upping your whip limit is to get more work into dev because you're blocked further downstream is not the answer. It's actually just going to make everything slower across your whole board. It's going to make you look worse than you already are. So upping your whip limit is not usually the answer. Increasing the whip without reducing the throughput rate increases your lead time. Okay, that's the maths done. Oh no, I've lost one. I lost one with maths. The maths wasn't as easy as I said, sorry. No, that is the maths done. So, some of, I left you with some hanging questions right at the start though, because I'm, I'm a bit of a, a, a geek. I want to answer those questions. The first, so the first photograph was Andromeda. That was at only about 1,000 billion stars, a trillion stars. That photograph there, the Hubble Deep Field, is generally agreed to contain 3,000 galaxies, roughly 400 billion stars each. So that's actually 1.2 quadrillion stars. And at this point, I should have a little Brian Cox looking in the distance. <laughs> that's more grains of sand than on the entire planet. But it's, it's a very big number, as you can imagine. It goes million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, and so on. So that's quite a lot of stars, but it's a really big-ish. Okay. Talking to the stars. How do you do what Buzz Aldrin did there and make a footprint on the moon? Well, you finish one small step at a time. I've actually got that printed on my laptop because I am, again, a bit of a geek. But this is really important. Now, the way NASA put this in the 1950s and 1960s on their mugs was do one thing at a time with supreme excellence. Now, if you don't take anything else away from today, please take that one sentence with you because to me that is Kanban. There. If it's anything, that one sentence is going to give you, that's Kanban. But let's break it down because every word matters in that. 
Well, actually, let, before we do that, I'll just point out that a colleague of mine did say this to me in uh, Costa Coffee in Mornington Crescent. He says, as soon as our clients work out that all we're telling them to do is put everything into an ordered list, then finish them one at a time, we'll be out of a job. <laughs> that was about nine months ago, and I'm still on the same job, never mind uh, in work. So that is the truth, though. That the nuance is where it all really is, though, of course. So let's break it down. Do one thing at a time. Well, I've shown you the math, so you can see why it works. We can play games like how long does it take to the right of names, a great game to take back to your office to talk about with, by the way. Well, we've seen how it works, but back in the 50s and 60s, NASA were living this as an organization and as a large government organization with massive funding and a very public profile. And they still are today. There were some interesting comments from the head of NASA about self-organizing teams, which I find very interesting given that's exactly how they did do these things. But right now, they still do this. Pop quiz. Who supplies all the food, water, and experiments, and people up to the International Space Station nowadays? Is it NASA? Russia, and they've actually outsourced it to some American companies, private companies, like I think SpaceX is one of them, so they can send stuff up. Because NASA aren't doing the International Space Station anymore. Yes, they do have to have a number of staff uh, assigned to it as an ongoing mission, but that's not where their focus is. So that's not their one thing right now. Anyone know what it is? What are NASA focusing on right now? Star. <laughs> It's almost like you've seen this before, and I know you haven't. I will pay you later. So that there is the capsule that they're develop, getting developed that will hopefully actually be the first one that will take humans out of the magnetosphere of the Earth. Very geeky, I know, but that will hopefully get us the next step to Mars. But is that all of NASA? Well, there is another very high-profile part of NASA, which is really a separate organization. But to be 100% honest, they are there, and they're called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. They make the rovers and the space telescopes. Now, it's important I bring the space telescope up because this is going to come back in a minute. But the minute Hubble's finished, the mission's got, gone far beyond parameter, and yes, they're still taking photographs, but they're not really servicing it anymore. Ever since the space shuttle, it's pretty much done. They're not upgrading the cameras. That's done now. Of course, they're focusing on the James Webb Space Telescope. So they're doing the same thing. They're focusing on one big thing at a time. Got the Mars rover, now it's, James, uh, now it's James Webb. They are limiting their whip organizationally to some very, very big projects, but they're working on those projects virtually in isolation. What about the second half with supreme excellence? Who's read David Anderson's book, Kanban? You know, I still remember the first time I read it when I found it on Chris Young's reading list, I've got to say. And <laughs> it's really handy if you're going to go to an interview, look at the reading list on LinkedIn of somebody who's going to interview you. Top tip. But it was a really good read. And I don't know if you were like me, but when I um, read the first thing you want to start with is quality, I was like, yeah, right, okay, no, we've got quality, that's fine. And then I walked into UView and thought, wow, we should start with quality. <laughs> That's not this in the company, it's just the, the particular phase of organization that they were in at the time. They were coming out of R&D into development, only kind of no one had told the dev team at the time, and they had to work it out for themselves. So uh, actually having someone come in with different eyes, with a different view, can really help on that. But yeah, it's not just about showing off. It's not NASA saying, with supreme excellence, because we're NASA. By the way, I don't work for NASA, although I really could, sorry, but I'd really quite fancy working for NASA if anyone here head hunting. I'd love to have that on my CV. It means focus on the quality. Now, that sounds obvious, but it's true. We know that after, after launch, bugs are expensive to fix, right? Well, imagine if you're talking about in space. Do you remember that? When they launched Hubble, and it didn't work. Everything came out fuzzy. I believe it was a difference in a conversion someone had made between inches and millimeters. And just because you know they have the different parts doing different things for you and outsource things. Not that that's a different problem, but they got it launched and it didn't work. And they spent billions of dollars to fix that problem. And it was very public and it was very embarrassing to the organization. Now, another thing in Anderson's book that I didn't quite get at first was the, I give you permission not to write any more bugs, which sounds very glib. But what he meant was, by that, 
If you're working in this room and you are being pressured by a project manager or somebody else to get something live and you don't think it's ready, you think it's still buggy, tell them to come and see me and I'll explain to them why they, you are not launching that thing. I give you permission not to write any more bugs. It's really expensive to fix things in space. It's, it's very bipolar, I get that, but it you know, polarizes the thing, but it really does make it obvious. James Webb Space Telescope, so you probably can't see this little blue orbit around the Earth, that's Hubble orbiting the Earth. They could fix that. And there's the moon, 400, sorry, 384,400 kilometers away. That's where James Webb Space Telescope is going to be, which is 1.5 million kilometers away. If it doesn't work after launch, it was a really, really big waste of money. Or a lot of validated learning that didn't lead to anything. <laughs> Hopefully they've done enough validated learning that by the time they do launch it, there will be value delivered. But once it's gone, it's gone. So I don't think, again, any of us work in that environment where once something's launched is that far removed that we can never fix it again. NASA do, which is why this matters to them. One thing at a time with supreme excellence. Focus on the quality. Focus on what we're doing. Don't get distracted. So what about us? Isn't everything meant to be safe to fail? This is something that's already been talked about several times by different people this morning. It's always the danger of being halfway through a day like this. You don't know what everyone's going to say first. I was going to say yes and no to the answer, the answer to that one. Yes before launch, no post launch. So if you're, I don't know, doing an ambulance scheduling software, you remember that project that happened in London a few years ago? And people died. That wasn't exactly safe to fail after launch. Before launch, it was perfectly safe to fill. There was an existing system. It, people weren't dying because of that. They could fix that. They could get it right. So it's safe to fill right up to the point you press the button. So it's really important we remember that. Again, it's the NASA thing. But there are places where the blue screen of death isn't just a phrase. But even if you're not working in that environment, fixing bugs post-live is really, really expensive. I remember doing a case study again at UV. I'm going to bring that one up again. Um, the blue glow. We missed a blue glow off a menu bar. Everything on UView has blue glows behind the user experience. And because we missed that roughly 10 minutes of work at the point of development, that bug, I, I tracked it, took two days to fix. <coughs> the, only p the whole piece of work with the menu bar took half a day. And it would have been 10 minutes to fix it, but it took two days to fix that bug. After we've wasted all that effort finding it, triaging it, scheduling it, talking about it, printing it on cards, putting in the bug tracking system, keeping the bug tracking system up to date, explaining why we're not doing it yet. We wasted so much effort on something that would have taken 10 minutes if we'd have just taken the time to have quality at development. Which leads us to this, the if you love it, let it go theory of quality and throughput. Most heads of and program managers are looking for throughput. I mentioned this earlier, they're looking for that throughput rate, yeah? They want things out of your team. They want to see good cadence. That's the thing they really want to see. How often are you getting stuff out? How often are you making me look good to the rest of the business? Well, if you throw focus on throughput, what's going to happen? If all you're doing is finishing features, you're going to get bugs. And bugs need fixing. And you're going to build technical debt. If you focus on delivery to date, you will get technical debt build up. Absolutely guaranteed it. That's all going to lead to slower throughput. By focusing on throughput, you're going to get slow throughput. You're going to get a graph, made up graph, not real data, something like this. Throughput, focus, 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 drops and stays level. Technical debt increases and stays level. You don't get increased technical debt forever because actually you stopped working on the thing at this point. You can't get anything out, so why would you actually be building any more technical debt up? And all the way through, you're, you're, you're just steadily creating bugs probably more than you're fixing. So at UVA, that's kind of where we were starting to get to. I remember that there was a big change in the team. And what we did was we got QA people into the dev team. I know that sounds radical. And we got them to take ownership of the done column. So what happens when we focus on quality instead? Well, eventually the bug count drop. I've got to say eventually, because we had been maxing out the QA team downstream of us for ages and they took a while still finding bugs we'd already written. But the tech debt dropped as well. 
You're going to see that. You're going to see you're not writing rubbish. You're focusing on quality. It matters suddenly. We've got to take the time to get the quality right. Your lead time increases. It's almost guaranteed. You're going to take longer to develop your code. But what's going to happen with the throughput? Well, we're not fixing bugs anymore because we're not writing bugs anymore. Failure demand dropped. Technical debt dropped because we're actually reviewing our code or pair developing it or doing whatever we're doing to ensure quality is high. But we've got all extra capacity. And that's just the obvious thing. When I was with, at UView, <laughs> we had a team with 18 open heads of ActionScript developers. I wouldn't say Flash developers. These were serious developers who happened to be using ActionScript. That's a really rare skill set. We spent ages and put a lot of effort into finding good ones. Chris certainly put a lot of effort into finding good ones. Problem is, every time we hired one, another one left. So we had 18 heads, but we only ever had 13 bums on seats, plus or minus one at any given time. We were working in a slightly toxic environment where we were being pushed to debt and beaten up by a program manager every other day, and it wasn't nice. So I kind of took the hit and took the deflection and said, no, we're going to focus on this quality. Come beat me up about it, leave the team alone. We got into the state where we're delivering high quality code, and wasn't it a shock? We suddenly had 18 developers. And we actually had to turn some people away occasionally. We were being recommended to people's mates as a place to work. And that's not a direct causal link, or it doesn't seem to be, but actually it was. But it was an indirect benefit. And of course, what happens to your throughput if you've got more people writing the software? And if you've got less people coming on board and leaving and having to have that relearning going on? Of course it's going to go up. You're making your place a happier place to work. You're entering a virtuous circle rather than a vicious cycle. Back to the moon. Finishing one small step at a time. So NASA, you might know their, their story. They start off the Mercury program, which is basically an intercontinental ballistic missile with a man on top. Absolutely really was. Then they had the speech from uh, JFK. Within 10 years, we choose to do these things because they are hard. Absolutely. First project was Gemini. Gemini, because they wanted to get two astronauts in space, so they had to have a bigger rocket. And they wanted to see, the, the main parameters for the mission were two weeks in space and docking spacecraft in space, because they knew they would have to do that to get to the moon. Actually, they terminated Gemini earlier because they'd worked out that it hit 90% of the value and the other 10% wasn't worth getting and started on Apollo. That's true, isn't it? Apollo. Apollo 1 landed on the moon? Big bang? All right, no, sorry, it wasn't, was it? Apollo 1 was actually a huge disaster where the, pilots di the astronauts died on the platform. A lot of learning and failure. Very sad that they died, but there was a lot of learning came from that. And actually, most of the early Apollo missions from that were unmanned until they got their stuff sorted out on safety. They were still learning the validated learning, but they chose to do it unmanned for a while. So, some notable missions. Apollo 8 was the first time they sent man around the moon, the furthest they ever had. How does that work? Are we going to have trouble with radiation? Have we already docked our craft in space and gone around and come back? That works, great. We can validate that learning, move on. Right, we've got this lunar ex excursion module. The, if you remember Apollo 13, the film, the, how about that lem, guys? Well, the lunar excursion module was launched in that mission, Apollo 9. Apollo 10. I really feel sorry for these guys. They dropped did everything on the mission that they got you to the moon, apart from landing. They, got, they dropped it, and they got to nine miles of the surface, and back to space, more validated learning. We know how to do this. We can get the LEM dropped. We can put it on target, pretty much. Then Apollo 11. And, and by the way, to feel even worse for the Apollo 10 guys, that was Lovell and Co that actually went on Apollo 13. That was their reward for that, was to actually go to the moon. And then when they did, it all went wrong. So they never got there. So I really do feel sorry for them. But how do you get there? They did it by doing it. Anyone heard of proof of concept work? We don't make to test this code properly. It's just proof of concept. Rubbish. It tends to get live. So focus on real work. Get the validated learning by doing the real thing. Every step NASA took moved them a step closer to getting to the moon. If they'd have tried to launch an Apollo 1, just taking all, that year, all those years to actually get it right and just not launching in the meantime, 
they couldn't have done it. They literally would not have had the learning. The science would have been unknown. The actual real metrics and empiricism from doing these things drove them to do it. Yes, it's extreme. Yes, we're not launching man to the moon in, in our daily lives, typically. But what we do can learn from it. If you can do it on a really complicated thing, the com most complex thing we've ever done, really, as a species, of course you can do it on you're launching a retail banking system or putting an online shop in the place. These things just work. Actually, if you look back in history, the reason I'm showing a V2 rocket over the side is that the moonshot started really with the V2. Has anyone seen the video clips on YouTube or, or anywhere else of the V2s all blowing up or falling over sideways and blowing up while Werner von Braun was trying to work out how to get a rocket to take up vertically without actually falling down on itself or exploding? The gyroscope problem is actually how we sol you've solved it with the gyroscope. But all of that was validated learning that went on to work on the uh, Saturn Vs that got man to the moon. He was actually the big prize America won in the Second World War, if anything was won in that at all. They took him along and uh, stole him before the Russians got to him, and that's probably why they got to the moon. So what can we learn? If NASA can do it, we can. They're big, multi-billion dollar organization. Very public profile, very bureaucratic, and they can limit with. So what's stopping us? The biggest of bangs can be delivered incrementally using validated learning. It leads to success or failing fast, and which leads to lots of money saved or finding new ways to do things. So actually doing that is really important. And you can tackle risk by using collaborative experimentation. Even if you can't launch slides, for example, you've got a system that's going to have a new warehouse for shipping goods, and you can't launch your project until the physical warehouse is ready. Doesn't mean you can't use collaborative experimentation to reduce the risk. If you're going to be launching in a year's time, why would you want to find out in 11 months' time that it isn't going to work if you could find out next month? So let's do that. Let's actually do that. Let's use the collaborative experimentation to reduce our risk and have that validated learning that gets us there. So if you remember back to my challenge, 36 minutes and 29 seconds ago, it was estimates inform us when things will finish. I don't think that's true. And I think, firstly, coming on from what David Snowden was saying this morning, estimates are only going to work where things aren't complex, adaptive. Because how can you estimate something when you don't know what it is you're going to do? Fundamentally, you can't. And you don't know what you're going to do in a complex, adaptive system until you actually start doing it and you're in flight. Predictability based on real numbers is better. You can have a better conversation with your stakeholders if you're talking about maths. This is what we did last year. This is what we did in the last deliverable. This is what we did last week. You can see the average and you just trend it out. We can show you the diversions from the averages because we're holding the data. If there's one thing I can impress upon you other than I already have about do one thing at a time, supreme excellence, it's keep your data. Never walk out of an organization without your data because you'll need it at some time. You'll be kicking yourself, trust me. I still am kicking myself about data I've left behind in places. Because it will teach you a lot of things. And it'll teach you things that you haven't thought of yet. And you just want that big data set to back you up and you haven't got it. That's so annoying. So keep your data. I don't think Kanban does use difficult maths. It's often presented as difficult. But it, you can use simple maths and get at least 90% of the value. Which is what we talk about in Kanban. Getting value the least early. Spending as little effort to get as much value. So yeah, we should do that. And simple maths will get you most of the value. And can't you limit within big organizations? What's stopping us? Really, when it comes down to what's stopping our organizations from limiting their web if they choose to do it? It's all got a bit quiet again. Sorry, I've been giving you lots of information. Bravery earlier, didn't they, first thing this morning? Absolutely. Bravery, courage, it is one of the values from Scrum, absolutely having the courage to go and talk to these people and get them to understand it. And I think using some of the things that um, I was just seeing from Carl Scotland earlier about actually you know, getting the, not the metrics and the data and going through a, a, a hierarchy to present it back. Getting past beliefs has always been a tricky thing. People have beliefs, so I've come across a CIO recently who has a belief that pair programming doesn't work. Despite all these facts and charts I've been shown, I don't believe in it. 
and he calls me an evangelist. But that's, that's the problem. He has a core belief that it isn't going to work having two people sat around one machine. He thinks that's going to be inefficient because to him that's obvious. It doesn't, doesn't matter how much we rationalise it and show proof that actually you're getting four times the brain power for two times the cost. Of course it's more effective. He ain't going to buy it. It doesn't matter. It's not what he believes in. So that's an interesting thing. So, validated learning doesn't deliver anything. Without validated learning, we can't get out of the complex adaptive space. And I think that's important. When you think about what we do, if we're writing software, if that's what our chosen profession is, then we are making things which are complex adaptive and making them simple. Because if you can put it into a computer in an algorithm, basically that's what you're doing. You're making something simple. You're bounding it by acceptance criteria. You're making something simple. You're turning it into a simple thing. So we've gone from complex, good complicated, to simple. So how do we get there? Validated learning. So we actually go and do all those clever things around gathering what we need to talk about and gathering what we need to work on. But actually at the point where we're turning thoughts into code, that's complicated. It's hard to do that. That's why we have to go and find really good people. We have to find our experts, our fantastic super developers and super QA people that are going to keep us right. But by the time the code's delivered, if we've delivered it right, that's, that's now simple. It must be. If you can make a machine or a production line out of it, it must be. So that, I think that's important that we use that validated learning and go through those loops to get there. That's all I've got presented. So has anyone got any questions for me or for the group? Another question, we're just picking up on your massive thing. The story that I always come back to is the one about the loading um, on the first stage of the uh, documentary where one of the one of the engineers was basically saying this is not going to work. And the manager said, take off your engineering hat and put it in your business hat. I think that's I I could use that as an example of you're being pressurized by management to do something which has many experts no, it will not work. This is, so this ties into other things actually. I was, I was talking to someone recently who said about empowerment. If you ask for empowerment, you've already disempowered yourself from that empowerment. You should take that empowerment and talk about it and say that you've got it, but not ask for permission to take it, because since you've asked for permission, it's not there. So actually saying, as the engineer, in that case, no, this isn't going to work. And I think back to talk to Don Rice, he mentioned earlier, um, a couple of years ago out in Benelux, he was saying that, so he's from the nuclear physics field, nuclear power stations, and they were talking a lot about the, the tsunami and what happened over in Japan. And apparently, there was a head of engineering who said, we need to flood these reactors seven hours before they did, before the thing went critical. But the management wouldn't let them because they knew as soon as they flood them with seawater, that's it, the reactor's gone, we'll never have it again. So he procrastinated so long that the decision was made for him and the thing basically melted down and there was a huge radioactive problem because the expert wasn't empowered to make the decision at the point of need. So actually, yeah, it's really important that we empower people to make the right decisions. And yes, we need to be aligned to the business, but once we've decided there's a problem and put an expert in place to solve that problem, we need to give them the power to do that thing. Again, well, Martin also talks about you know, software craftsmanship and professionalism. And yeah. One of the things you have to be able to do is say no, otherwise you're not a professional. Why are they paying you if you're not prepared to stand up and say no? Well, I, I think, it, again, I mentioned extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators. I'm a big believer in the whole damn pink thing and looking at mastery, autonomy, and purpose. <coughs> If you're giving experts autonomy to make decisions, <coughs> their motivation rises. Who'd have thought? You've got an expert and they want to use their expertise. They want to use their mastery. They want to be seen as a master, but they want to have the autonomy to use that. Then you've just got to make sure you've got the right purpose and they're going very well. <coughs> so, we need to look at the complexity of the McNamara's example, because the first thing I thought when you, when you showed the, um, the window where you collected blue is that they've got more than one price behind there, so that's going to be less than well, so firstly, yes, the complexity is almost hidden by the average thing. So you've got the problem when someone orders the fish sandwich rather than the standard burger. So, you know, they, t they don't have as many on demand 
So the average is going to be affected by those people. And they then have a special way of dealing that with the little grill order parking off the side. Yes, I was absolutely hiding a lot of complexity in that system to make it approachable and simple for people to understand. Because it's not really about understanding the drive through that's important here. It's about understanding how the maths comes out of that in a model that we can all reach to. So that's why I was using metaphor. I personally think game is the best way to go on any kind of learning like this. Get people to do it themselves. But really kind of hard to get a game going in a group like this, especially when you don't know how big it's going to be. So I, I chose to use metaphor as a second best. But yes, there is, there is more complexity. And the more you look at it, what they've done at these fast food restaurants to really understand their complexity and, and turn it into something simple that really works, the more clever I think those guys are. A lot of thought going into it. It's really Is that waterfall, or is that just delivering or deploying to life? Well, that was that was what I wanted to ask. Is that do we also face that same kind of issue? That doesn't matter how much we do at a certain point, but you're launching it out into into space. Well, you're turning safe to fill to to non safe to <coughs> Absolutely, yes. There is there is a point, and what we have to do is mitigate and test and prove that everything's right leading up to that. Of course, yeah. At some point, the things launch. There's a study about the, the Mars lander, and I'm, I'm not sure they confirm what you're saying or the other way around. So the, the reasoning behind the Mars lander is that they said, well, we've got these very big programs, and if, if it fails, then it fails, yeah. right? And so the reasoning behind Mars, Mars lander was, let's scale down the, the, uh, the programs so that our cost of failure is a lot less, mm -hmm. right? And so rather than having one $300 billion program, we'll have 10 $30 billion programs. Yep. And then they sent out the first one. Yep. And it failed. I don't know whether you remember. One in four yeah. missions to Mars fail, statistically. Yeah. So the first one failed, and then uh, that was it. Because it was not about money, but it's about the... Uh, the learning. Yeah, it's, it's about your, uh, your public exposure, right? Yeah, your prestige. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, and, yeah, and also, the world does change around you. That's another level of complexity to make it even more difficult. You know, if you're working in a particular field and then something fundamentally happens in that field to change the market while you're halfway through doing something big, yeah, that's going to change. So, yeah, it's not, but the thing is, before launch, it was safe to fail. It's only when after it did go on launch that it was no longer safe to fail because of the exposure, because of everything going on there. But that said, Apollo 1 was about as public a failure as you could possibly get, and we still go to the moon. So it's about being able to withstand that and decide if that is still your priority. So again, it comes back to your purpose gene, if you like, your purpose or whatever. What's the purpose of doing this? And if you lose your purpose, if there's no gain to be had, you stop the mission. That's why there wasn't an Apollo 18 or Apollo 19, because they'd lost the public. They'd done what they needed to do. They got the validated learning. Despite the science that was yet to be done on Apollo, there just wasn't the desire to do it and spend that amount of money anymore. So yeah, they met their value and there was, there was no point in gluing anymore. So again, this is all in the 1960s. But this is stuff we talk about in Agile now as if it's brand new. But it's not, it's been there for a long time. And I think that's something again Dave Snowden mentioned earlier. It's, a lot of this stuff isn't new, it's just that we're relearning it again. And it's the cost of relearning, I guess, there's waste in here. I think it's time for food. I am now starting to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.